This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death, a repertorium of violence. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a briefcase, a medicine bottle, a carpenter's rule, all are touched by murder. And this old-fashioned trunk, it's a familiar object, brass-bound, well-made in its previous generation kind of way. Perhaps you've one like it in the attic or the storeroom. Perhaps you've traveled with it at one time. Even checked it at the luggage room. I see this one. A little, I suppose. There you are, sir. Your receipt. We'll watch over your trunk, sir. Nothing to worry about. Yes, I'm sure you will. Well, today, that trunk can be found in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Mausoleum of murder. It's not particularly well lit. Involved feeling disappears in shadows, but ghosts like shadows. The vast majority of the people who use the articles exhibited here are ghosts. By the verdict of twelve of their fellow countrymen, a sentence by His Majesty's judges and the assistance of the execution. Here. Here lies death. All along the walls, on the tables, even on the floor, each article feels encrusted with horror, webbed in the memory of homicide. Some for more than a century. Here, on this shelf, it's a common object, a gasoline can, about a gallon, but the contents were poured over a human body and a match was lighted. Only the man who poured that horrific libation left his fingerprints on the tin. easily handled. It's empty now. But once upon a time, oh yes, this is a tale. For our intents and purposes, it begins in Charing Cross Station in London, with a porter who noticed someone drop a bit of paper in the hurrying crowd. Here, Davy. Tell her to drop this. I tried to catch him. No luck. <laughs> Too bad. He meant to throw this away, though. You'd have had nothing from him for your trouble. How do you mean he meant to throw it away? Well, crumble into a little ball, isn't it? All crinkled like it is. Yeah, that's true enough. Here, but look at your time stamp. He checked that trunk in with you ten minutes ago. See? Yeah. You're right about that. Ten minutes ago. If the paper had been dropped in a waste can, if the obliging porter hadn't seen it fall, if there'd been no time stamped on it, yeah. What are you doing in cases like this, mate? Well, just wait a bit and then notify the police. Well, why, why, wait a bit? Yes, wait a bit. Indeed. Just to be certain that the fellow who threw the receipt away meant to do it. I'm a cautious fellow, a check room attendant. After three days, I want to ask you about the trunk. He didn't call the local police station. No, not he. He placed his call to Scotland Yard. Inspector Walsh dropped by to have a look at the trunk. It feels heavy, isn't it? Of course, it might be just books. Uh, in it, I mean, Inspector. And yeah, it might be just books. Ready? Open. Oh, just old newspapers, it looks like. Oh! Sorry to startle you. 
A dissected body isn't a very pretty sight when you're not used to it. Another dramatic incident in the life of Harry Lyme unfolds this Thursday evening at 9.30 on KUOW. Orson Welles stars as the adventurous rogue Harry Lyme in each exciting episode of the series. For suspense and drama, join us Thursday evenings at 9.30 for The Lives of Harry Lyme. The trunk was removed to Scotland Yard. Its contents, once human, were turned over to the yard pathologist. The remainder of the contents were left in the possession of Inspector Walsh. We're in for it, Sergeant. Again. Body, unidentified. Trunk, unidentified. Owner, unidentified. Well, at least we have a few items to start with this time, sir. Yes, of course. Some old newspapers, torn, stained, and so on. An old smock, stained in the same way. Some scraps of clothing. And the trunk. Well, where do we begin, sir? Save the papers, have the clothing laundered after these stains have been analyzed, then check the laundry marks. On the trunk itself, write up a description of it. Then start the local police into every second-hand dealer, luggage shop and pawn shop in London. Someone, somewhere, may remember it. After all, it is a trifle large, you know, and it had to be brought to the station. Circulate the description through all the means of transportation. Taxi cabs, buses, vans, you know, Sergeant. Routine, we've been through all this before. Routine. Started a few scraps of clothing, some poor human flesh, a brass-bound trunk. Cast the net. See what it catches. Throw out the line. See where they lead. One line led to a second-hand dealer in Brixton. I remembered it as soon as I saw the write-up, Inspector. Picked it up in an odd lot some time ago. Good of you to come in, sir. You're certain it's the same trunk you sold? Yes, sir. Funny about that label, though. Oh? Yes, sir. That's a fresh label. The one I saw, and it was old. Dirty. Ah. F. Matson, St. Leonard's. Let's see now. Uh, there's your old table. Underneath a new one. Same address, sir. Yes. But the old one was spelled correctly. Notice? Leonard's. L-E-O-N-A-R-D-S. The new one is Leonard's. L-E-N-A-R-D-S. No O. Hence the reason the fellow who bought it didn't live in St. Leonard's. He'd know how to spell it if he lived there. Now, that's probably correct. Remember what he looked like? The fellow who bought it? Husky, rather. Well-dressed. Very blondish. Straw hair, blue eyes. Almost white eyebrows. I noticed particularly his eyebrows. I knew a girl once with eyebrows like that. Uh, very whitish. Interesting. Yes, interesting. The description of a man. But the man who killed a woman in the trunk... That was one of many questions. Among them, of course, who was the woman in the trunk? We've traced the laundry marks on the clothing, Inspector. Family named Hilton in Shepherd's Bush. Mrs. Hilton came to Scotland Yard. We're very sorry to have to ask you to do this, Mrs. Hilton, but uh, you may be able to help us. So, so this is what a, a morgue looks like, Inspector? Yes, more antiseptic than anything else. We'll make this as easy as possible. Uh, she's, uh... In here. Uh, all right. Yes, I, I know. I knew her. All right, Sergeant. Her name is... Was Brady. She worked for me as a cook, uh, temporarily. Uh, came to an employment agency. I, I can give you the address. The net was working, the lines were developing. Police routine, the Scotland Yard thoroughness was beginning to pay off. Uh, the woman's name was not Brady. At the address the employment agency gave me, she was known as Burnside. She's been missing since March the 4th. More muddy waters? Or another link? A woman with an alias, missing but unreported, inexorably. The wheels grind on, turning up, among other matters, a cooperative cab driver. You're a positive this was the trunk? Positive, Governor. Where did you get the call? In Ravenswood Row, it was. That line of old houses they've made offices out of. From the road to Charing Cross Station, it was. Do you remember the man himself? He had his hat pulled down, sort of. But he was a husky one. Oh, 
I remember thinking he had to be to get that trunk as far as the sidewalk on his own. And his hair, what I could see of it, was lightish. Well, I hope I've been help, Inspector. If I do remember anything more... Oh, yes, it was a help. So was the bus conductor who remembered letting a husky blonde man board his bus with his trunk, light and empty at the time, in Brixton, near the second-hand dealers. And piece by piece, the jigsaw puzzle was filling in. Patience, Sergeant. We know who the dead woman was. We have a description of a man with a trunk. We've traced the trunk from Brixton to Ravenswood Road, and from there to Charing Cross. Now, a house-to-house inquiry in Ravenswood. Be thorough, Sergeant. Very thorough. And, of course, the good Sergeant King was very thorough. A clerk on the first floor of number 12, Inspector, noticed the trunk in the hallway on the 5th of March. It was gone on the 6th. The day the trunk was checked at the station. Yes, sir. Now, number 12 has three floors, a suite of offices on each floor. The second floor is closed up, no name on the door. Third floor has been occupied for some time. I have the name of the rental agent, Inspector. Yes, Inspector, and number 12 is our building. We manage it from the state, that is. Uh, here now. Uh, yes, number 12, Ravenswood Row. The lessee is F. Lawrence Maxwell. Business factoring. The red tab on the car, that means pays by mail regularly. Then you've never seen Mr. Maxwell? No. One of our outside men showed him the premises. Would you be interested in his home address? Yes, I would. According to our records, he lives at 210 Merivale East in Camberwell. At last, a shadowy figure begins to emerge into the light. F. Lawrence Maxwell, 210 Merivale East. Campbell. At that address, Inspector Walsh asked, Is Mr. Maxwell at home? And the landlady answered, Mr. Maxwell? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. He moved the house and left no forwarding address. That was the evening of March the 6th. I remember it distinctly, sir, because he paid the whole month and didn't ask for a refund. A blank. The end of the line. Not a trace. <laughs> But don't forget, that brass-bound trunk is today one of the star exhibits in the Black Museum. Each Sunday afternoon at 4, KUOW brings drama back to radio with Theater of the Air. Each week... The net so painstakingly woven, the lines so carefully cast, all, all led to nothing. A trunk, a dismembered body, a dozen people all trying to help nothing. Was this going to be one of the mementos in the Black Museum marked Case Unsolved? Inspector Walsh waited. F. Florence Maxwell was somewhere, somewhere. And living people rarely have ever moved through life without a trace. gentleman came all the way from Campbellwell in Norway. And we went through a red light or two on the essay, didn't we, Sergeant? Yeah, we did that, sir. This letter you telephoned about, ma'am. Oh, right here, Inspector. Kept it careful. Always try to help the authorities when I can. Yes, sir. Ah. From the post office. Now, do we open it, sir? I think we do. Oh, dear. Nothing but a notice. Undelivered telegram. Yes, to Maxwell. Red Dog in Hammersmith. Funny, sending a telegram to himself in Hammersmith. Oh, that wouldn't be to himself. It would be to his wife. Mr. Maxwell told me once she has a position in Hammersmith. A wife. Well, well, well. Was she still in Hammersmith at the Red Dog Inn? She was. And so was F. Florence Maxwell. <laughs> I'd be glad to help in any way I can, Inspector. Any further details of your movements on March the 6th? Uh, to the best of your recollection, that is. No, I'm sorry. I, I may have left out a detail or two. 
It, it was a sudden decision. I mean, to give up the office. The business fell off to the point where an office was a needless expense. As I rented on a month-to-month -month basis, well, I just gave it up. I do remember noticing the old trunk in the hallway, though. <laughs> Quite a museum piece with all the brass trimmings, as I remember it. Well, most cooperative gentlemen, most helpful, is Sir Florence Maxwell. He even saw the trunk in the hallway. But on the inspector's next line of questioning, Mr. Maxwell was not quite so helpful. No, I'm sorry, Inspector. I've never known a woman named Burnside in my life. Nor Brady, for that matter. Any other name? Beginning with B, perhaps? Let me see. No, nearly one. Well, you've been very helpful, Mr. Maxwell. Nothing like the truth to prove innocence, is there? With that in mind, I wonder if you'll stretch your cooperation a bit further. Anything I can do. We have two witnesses who saw the man with the trunk closely enough to attempt identification. Both of them described a man of your coloring. I wonder if you'd let him have a look at you. Well, I'd, I'd rather not be identified by mistake, Inspector. I understand that. Isn't it usual to have several men of similar appearance present? I mean, I've seen such things in the cinema. Of course. Uh, in view of your willingness to assist us, we'll be glad to oblige you on that score. Decent of the inspector, don't you think? Decent of Maxwell, too. They worked well together. And within a few hours, Maxwell stood in a line of five men, all of them approximately his build and blondness. Maxwell was second from the left. A taxi driver entered the room. I'm none too certain, Inspector. My man had his hat pulled down. If it were any of these, I'd... I'd say he was the middle one, sir. Then the second-hand dealer entered the room. I... I wouldn't want to make trouble for the wrong man, Inspector. Of course not. Now, look him over carefully now. I'd say... Yes, the, the fellow on the extreme right. Thank you. Sorry to have taken you from your business this time of day. And thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, will you want me for anything else, Inspector? Thank you, no, Mr. Maxwell, not for the present. Yeah. Another blank. Nothing. No one to place Sir Florence Maxwell anywhere near that trunk or its contents beyond the casual contact he himself admitted. Mr. Maxwell went back to Hammersmith. Inspector Walsh went back to work. Sergeant, I want that trunk cleaned out thoroughly now. Piece those torn newspapers together. Have the smock the head was wrapped in given to the laboratory for every possible test. There's got to be something somewhere. Nothing out of the ordinary in the newspapers, Inspector. But the physical test laboratory reports that under ultraviolet light, the smock shows lettering that was printed on the material but washed out with constant laundering. And that lettering, Sergeant? Red Dog Inn, Hammersmith. Now, Sergeant, all we have to do is to connect that Brady Burnside woman with number 12 Ravenswood Row, second floor. Let's go, Sergeant. I've had a search warrant ready for a week. Now they went to work on 12 Ravenswood Road, second floor. Nice. Board by board, the flooring was taken out, the old-fashioned tin ceiling was taken down, the desks and chairs were taken apart, paneling was removed, and plaster walls sounded, samples of dust were analyzed, powerful vacuum cleaners sucked every bit of lint from the upholstery and draperies. And when it was all over, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Unless this hairpin is something, sir. Oh, that could be anyone's. Proves nothing. Ah. Uh, is there an ashtray around here? Anywhere, Sergeant? Yes, under the desk, sir. There's a waste basket. Metal one. Maxwell doesn't smoke. Yes, I remember that. Oh, well. Hello. Give me a tweezer, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. You have found something, sir. Interesting. Maxwell doesn't smoke. So we find an unused match caught in the corner of his waste basket. With a red brown stain on one end of it. Yes, of course it was blood. And the same type as the victims. But the fact remains, as the inspector put it, a clever defense counsel could make a hash of the case. Millions of people right in London have this blood type, and we still haven't established any contact whatsoever between Maxwell and the woman. A jigsaw puzzle. All of it save the key piece. Inspector Walsh made a decision the next morning, quite early, in Hammersmith. All right, Mr. Maxwell. I'm sorry to disturb you this early. Uh -huh. 
Oh, you, Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. There have been developments. We need you at the yard. Developments? What kind? I'm sorry, sir. I've not been told. Now, if you'll get dressed and come along, sir, I have a car waiting. It's early, I know, sir, but we don't keep regular hours at the yard. They don't keep hours, but they kept Maxwell waiting in the quiet ante room outside Inspector Walsh's office. For an hour and a half, Maxwell cooled his heels while detectives passed him by, went into and came out of the inspector's office. At long last, Sergeant King came to the door. All right, Mr. Maxwell. The inspector will see you now. At about time, I'd say. Ah, good morning, Mr. Maxwell. Sorry to have kept you waiting after rousing you so early. All right, Sergeant, you can leave us together. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mr. Maxwell. Yes, and without further ado, I'd like some explanation about all this. You said you were through with me. We were, but uh, there have been developments, new clues, all that sort of thing. No? Oh. Well, you thought you'd be interested. Oh, uh, excuse me a moment, won't you? Yes? You pushed the buzzer, Inspector. I asked the desk man to ring through. Yes, sir, I'll be right up. At once, sir. Uh, Superintendent Bivens wants to, Mr. Maxwell. But... I won't be long. Don't try to get out through that window. The view is good, but there's a 60-foot drop to the river. Be back in a bit. I must say, Inspector, this is all wrong. Time ticked away, marked by the clock on the office wall. And F. Florence Maxwell was alone. Alone with a thousand unanswered questions. And his own fears. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Walking up and down, back and forth like some kind of caged beast. He can't know anything. He couldn't get me identified. Have they tied me to Louise? How could they? I, I, I destroyed every one of her letters. I never wrote to her. Uh, he thought she had me. She got what was coming to her. Right in the office. She dared to come to the office. Oh. Did they find anything in the office? In the office, Mr. Maxwell? Yes. They found a hairpin and a matchstick with blood on it. But you don't know that, do you? You haven't been told. What could they find in the office? When I took her to pieces, they did it in the trunk. They can't have anything. Yeah, there must be something. Well, there's got to be the inspector in Scotland Yard holding me here. I deny it, but things look bad. Very bad. Oh, I've been here. Where's the clock? Yes, almost a half hour. I'll have a story. That's it. I'll have a story. I'll be ready for it. I'll have a story. Now, you've done it, Mr. Maxwell. So you have a story, will you? You better be good, Mr. Maxwell. <laughs> it better be good. Well, Mr. Maxwell, I'm back. Inspector. Yes? I want to tell you, sir, I've been holding back. I knew Mrs. Burnside. I see. You knew her? Yes, quite well. How doesn't matter. She tried to blackmail me, you see. She came to my office. When I refused to pay her one shilling, she flew at me. I hit her and, well, she fell. Where did you hit her? The, the left side of her face. She fell and struck her head. When I bent over her, she was dead. So I, I left her there. I came back. I, I must have been crazy expecting a dead woman to get up and walk. I was scared, you see. I bought the trunk. Well, you know the rest. Very well, Mr. Maxwell. You're taken in charge for murder. Mur I must warn you, anything you say may be taken down in writing and used as evidence. But it was an accident, not, not murder. Sorry, Mr. Maxwell, but the medical evidence belies your story. Mrs. Burnside died of strangulation. You didn't hit her. You choked her to death. So, that winds up the case of Mr. Maxwell. But if you're interested, you'll still find the brass brown trunk in the place of honor in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment.
In the end, it was just routine, wasn't it? Methodical, hard-working routine based on experience, and plus just the touch of imagination a good policeman must always have. The trap was sprung in Wadsworth Prison, and the story ended three weeks later in the usual manner at the customary time. Eight o'clock in the morning with a customary payment to the hangman. And the trunk remains in its customary place within Scotland Yard. The Black Museum. And I, I remain as always, obediently yours.